welcome to the first <laughs> Yours event of the new academic year. And um, before I introduce Sharon McDonald, Sarah is going to explain what's happening with the technology. <laughs> Uh, we decided um, this year that we might experiment with uh, live streaming the um, your seminars to open up um, the conversation beyond the, the walls of uh, K159. And so I've had incredibly wonderful support from IT services, um, represented here by um, Tom Smith, uh, who has familiarized me with the way to put all of this stuff together. And um, so we uh, have asked our speakers uh, whether they'd be willing to be um, recorded for uh, others to view in the moment, and Sharon has graciously agreed. Uh, so the um, <laughs> her talk is going to be broadcast uh, through Google Hangout onto YouTube. Um, uh, so. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's live. <laughs> so in the first instance, we're testing it out through my uh, YouTube account. And if you're really geeky and you want to check uh, that as it's uh, being broadcast, my account is youtube.com slash user slash Dr. Sarah Perry. Um, uh, so this is the first instance of testing testing the t this tool out and um, we, we're going to shut off the live feed uh, for the question um, period um, but for those of you who use Twitter there's a hashtag um, hashtag yours y-o-h-r-s um, that uh, you can uh, follow along with as well and so we'll give it a go <laughs> uh, and I'll return to John to do the formal intro thank okay. you Thanks, Sarah. So, um, yours is changing. It's sort of moved forward a little bit. We have the um, we have the technology that Sarah's just explained, but also um, we have a, a, a very full program this year as well, and, and everything is on on our on the website now, so you can see the, um, the yours presentations all the way through to the end of the spring term. I think that's as far as we go. Um, but during the course of the year, we will, I'm sure, be adding in various sort of ad hoc events under the same banner. So do keep an eye on the website for, for new events and additional events that, that crop up. The usual format is um, pretty much the same as in the past couple of years, but it's shifted by, sort of gone back by 15 minutes because of the, the, the way the rooms are booked here. So 5.15, congregate here, glass of wine, and then we start the presentations about half past five, um, and we've got about an hour or so, depending on how long the speakers want to talk for and how long the question goes on for. Um, I think that's it in terms of housekeeping arrangements um, and the program. So um, it just remains really to introduce Sharon McDonald. And very pleased that Sharon accepted the invitation to come along and give the first yours um, presentation of the of the year. Um, because Sharon is now one of us. Well, not one of us <laughs> here, but one of us at the university. Um, Sharon was appointed comparatively recently as an anniversary, anniversary chair in the sociology department. Um, but I think she's she's very well known to a lot of us within archaeology who studied various aspects of heritage in museums um, for various books that she's published about museums, but also a book about Nuremberg and Germany coming to terms with its Nazi past, for example. So any, any of us who deal with the troubled past will, will have come across some of Sharon's material as well. But this this is very much a new departure for Sharon, which she's going to talk about tonight. She's interested in museum shops and museum shopping. And as she says in her um, her, her sort of um, notes that accompany the talk. She spent a lot of time and money in museum shops, so now <laughs> it's time to do some research on it. So <laughs> Over to you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, John, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Sarah, as well. And, yeah, it's really great to, to be here, and as well because I can try out some ideas on you and try and get some information. Uh, from you, which maybe is going slightly against the spirit of all this high tech, which I have to confess I've forgotten that this was going to happen. So, if, 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 you know, there's no consent form that I'm going to be handing out, but um, if you don't want to speak, just don't speak. It's, it's, your, it's your choice. Um, I might begin, though, with some questions. Is there anybody here who doesn't possess anything at all from a museum or heritage site shop? 
Right. Okay, so to camera, <laughs> they all have something. <laughs> it's, it's getting more professional now. Is, is there anybody who's ever just been to a museum or heritage site shop without going to the museum itself? Well, I reckon that's almost 50%. <laughs> yeah. Is there anybody who'd say they probably habitually spend more time in the shop than... <laughs> no, I'm not quite surprised about that. Oh, well, you obviously weren't doing the background research that I've been doing. Supposing all this work on museums for a long time. Um, what I want to do, though, is really this, this work... On the one hand, it's, it is something that I sometimes think I've been doing this sort of obsessive, compulsive auto-ethnography for years and years on, um, but it is also part of a new project that I've been trying to get going for quite a while, and I'm actually really delighted that now, uh, just beginning, um, uh, in collaboration with the British Museum through one of, one of these um, AHRC co collaborative doctoral awards, um, Hannah, Hannah Errington, who's here, <laughs> hello Hannah, um, is, is going to be beginning a PhD, so in, in collaboration with the British Museum and the British Museum Company, which is a commercial um, wing of the museum. And I just put there just one of the things that I've kind of written about it in the past. So really what I'm doing is giving a background to some of the ideas that I had beforehand, which Hannah can utterly ignore if she likes, but it's also a kind of chance for me to tell her where I was sort of coming from when I set it up. But I, because I have a really, there's quite a lot of reasons why I did it, I'm going to try to keep it quite short. Um, and please just start making signals to shut up if I keep, I get a bit over enthusiastic. Um, so I'm just going to, so a little bit of sort of background about some of the, the ideas from theory, why I kind of got into this, um, from kind of where I was coming from. A little bit about the history of museum shops, and a little bit about some sort of, of the background work that I did when I was, I was thinking about it, which are things, I suppose, really setting out some things that might possibly be interesting to follow up. But basically, there could easily be at least 10 PhDs in the sorts of directions. So this is really just going to um, flit around in various uh, places. Um, so as John said, I, I've done um, kind of work on museums for quite a while. And actually, partly why I'm interested in museums is that I think they're kind of weird. So for lots of people, museums are sort of worthy and educational and things, and, and they are. But one reason that I find them interesting is I just think, so as an anthropologist, you know, looking cross-culturally and thinking historically, this business of accumulating all this stuff in these places, there's something sort of odd going on there in many ways. So that, 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 that interests me, what, what, what's happening. And, Various people have written various things, and just to sort of quickly go over, uh, and sort of just pick out one person who I think said something interesting on that. I quite like, um, in some ways, the work of Donald Preziosi. Um, and lots of people say he's horribly difficult to read, which he is, though slightly easier to read is the chapter that he wrote in My Companion to Museum Studies, I made him write it all clearly. <laughs> um, but um, if you want an introduction, and Brain of the Earth's Body is a lovely, a love, has lots of lovely ideas, but you can get just an easier version, actually, in my, my, my companion. Um, but one of the things he really does is he really kind of questions what are museums about? What are they doing? And part of his answer there is that museums are also, I suppose, when I did a book called Theorising Museums with a colleague, we had this idea that museums are in some sense setting up kind of theories about how the world is and how, how to think about issues like subjects and objects and so on. Um, and that's partly what Preziosi uh, gets at in his, um, in, in his work. So the museums are also spaces for thinking about questions about temporality, about the nature of personhood but doing so through very um, concrete, concrete ways. So as part of thinking about museums, one of the things I'm interested in is actually thinking about the museum, not necessarily just as a specific isolated institution, 
but it's how it relates to other things going on in other parts of life, um, other institutions perhaps, but expanding the museum um, beyond its galleries. And in my own work and various work that I, I kind of suppose I, I, I like, I think you can see some of that going on in, in various directions. So a lot of work, uh, 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 yeah, a lot of work on museums has tended to begin from the point of view of the exhibitions or the galleries, and, and often really just that becomes what the museum is. That just the, 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 the gallery, the exhibition space, and a lot of analyses work in terms of trying to basically read off meanings, nature of the nation, or whatever, from from the gallery space. One thing that I've been interested in doing is trying to push beyond that in various directions. So partly looking at actually what goes on to produce that, so the background, the work that's involved in the museum, um, and uh, so actually looking at it partly as a workspace. One of the things that does in some ways is destabilizes the kind of theoretical accounts that assume that we, we know what has gone in in terms of intention just from what comes out. So it, it, it sort of complicates that. Um, the other direction of taking it beyond these quite textual models of the museum, which are looking at the museum as though you can just read it as a, as a book, um, is actually looking to see, well, how is it consumed? How do people interpret it? So taking it into uh, visitor study as well. So it's really just expanding that field in those, those ways. I'm whizzing through a few things here, but um, the other way of expanding it um, beyond the way it's usually studied is, is especially looking at it in relation to other spaces um, and other practices and so on. And this it's been a good tradition of doing this and probably one of the most well known to many people working in the uh, museum field is that of Tony Bennett with his exhibitionary complex. And how he came to the museum, or what he does in his setting up of this idea of the ex exhibitionary complex, is he, um, he takes off from Foucault and the idea of the prison as a particular kind of institution. and he looks at the museum, in effect, as a different kind of complex along what he calls a carceral continuum. Now, he's not talking there just about um, what gets imprisoned in museums, um, but he does very interesting thinking about the nature of the museum by comparing it with other institutions, including the prison, but also including the fair. So through thinking about the different kinds of institutions, he, he sets up questions about what is going on, particularly in terms of how is, in his terms, the social being constituted. And especially his interest, and this comes from his interest in Foucault, is in questions of governmentality, and the formation of citizens. And that's what he really is particularly interested in, in relation to the museum. Now, I think that's one dimension of museums that one can look at. Um, but typically, I mean, that when he's doing that, he does partly look at things like architecture, and space, the layout of museums. Um, but a lot of it is looking at the written accounts of people's um, ambitions in uh, having museums, what they were hoping to achieve with the working classes, and so on. What he doesn't really talk much about are questions about objects and things in museums, sometimes, but um, mostly not. And one thing I suppose I'm interested in in relation to questions about museum shops is that they seem to offer something else than this. There's something else um, uh, go, going on here in terms of um, issues about, about space and objects. And in particular, I know it's going to do too many. Um, in particular, um, the question of objects strikes me as, as very, very interesting once you start thinking about the museum and about shops. 
because one thing they're both filled with are objects and things and this does seem an important dimension um, of mu museums that needs to be um, taken into account as well. Now as I come from anthropology, you know, I'm supposed to not wander too far away, but <laughs> um, And there's, there's a, obviously many, many literatures one can look at for um, talking about objects and thinking about them and here in archaeology we'll have lots of others that we can put in, into the discussion. But when I was um, thinking about these questions originally, one of the sorts of debates that I was especially, uh, I suppose I especially came out of um, were those in anthropology about uh, when is a thing a commodity and when isn't it? And of course those are the debates when I started to think about museum shops that came to mind quite quickly. Um, looking at the question of the things in the museum and the things in the shop. Um, so there um, literature like um, the work of most on the gift. And those questions he opens up there about what is going on um, with exchange and different types of exchange. So are the forms of exchange where actually the market transaction and the um, economics don't predominate because it's a gift relationship. That idea informing then other theorizing and taking it other ways like Kopitov, uh, like a Paderine Kopitov and the social life of things following through objects, this idea of an object biography, which it may at certain points in its lifetime be a commodity and at other points not. That was another area that seemed to me quite productive to potentially think about in relation to museum things and shops. Um, and Annette Weiner's work, where what she does is really um, we reorient some of those debates because she's interested in the things that you might potentially um, exchange, but somehow you haven't really, you've somehow really, really kept them. So a, a whole interesting body of work around the question of things, where they are, when they have certain meanings, um, when they have certain values and so on, um, which sort of was part of the background to this. And I just put a few a few others here. So Janet Hoskins's work on biographical objects. So objects that are used in storytelling. So she's especially talking about uh, her field work among the Kodi in Indonesia. Um, objects where which which could talk in some sense of things that people didn't really verbally articulate. So a particular kind of um, if you like, sort of special qualities uh, of objects that perhaps they have. Um, also talking about particular qualities or capacities of objects, work like Susan Stewart's on the souvenir. So the capacity of objects to actually, as, as in this quote here, serve as traces of authentic experience and to actually distinguish between particular experiences. It might be worth you thinking back to these museum objects that I now know you all possess. <laughs> Whether in your memory of those museums you can remember particular museums via them, or do they blur together perhaps into just any museum object, or does it when you see that I don't know, particular fridge magnet or whatever it is, take you back to that particular uh, museum. Um, and that idea as well that objects can carry um, particular times with them and open up the sort of windows into particular uh, times, places, mentalities as Preziosi puts it. Um, and just lastly, I'm just quickly going through a list of some of this rich sort of uh, background sets of ideas. I was very, I've been very interested in um, recent years in the sort of move towards the sensory and the effective and how perhaps things uh, 
particularly through particular kinds of sensory engagements, might also be bound up uh, with particular feelings and emotions, and perhaps particularly able to elicit those. And there also work like um, Jane Bennett's on vibrant matter, the way in which certain things seem so compelling and things, I think has, has something to offer us. Anyway, that is just the background to the questions then about museum and shop <coughs> objects and what might be going on. One of the things that Preziosi um, so we'd say argue, it's more like proposers, this could be the right term, um, is that once you have museums, even in existence, then the things outside the museum um, are not just any old things, they're things that are not in museums. Um, and what he's trying to get at there is that how you think about any kinds of objects is, is relational. Now, I think that's his, his statement, maybe putting it too strongly, but certainly for somewhere in close proximity uh, to the museum, that becomes potentially significant. But perhaps it's not so much that they're not in the museum, so when you get to the museum shop, but actually, but they are, but they're doing something else. So thinking about the relationships between things in um, objects in the museum and objects in the shop, there are lots of things that there are in common. They're selected, they're ordered, they're displayed. And I'll show you some pictures soon. But the key differences are that you can get your hands on them. And sometimes you can on museum objects, but mostly you can't. And of course, you can take them away. So you can, you can actually become the owner of them. So one of the things I'm interested in is that Going back to that sort of move, that sort of object biography idea and so on, what goes on in those transformations? And we can talk about that in terms of a sort of moral economy um, of things. But let's turn, oh no, sorry, yes, let's turn to another area that I think is quite productive in terms of thinking about it, because this is thinking about museum shops and the obvious other area that that falls into is work on consumption and especially on questions about identities. And there, just sort of briefly, the, there's a sort of long, longer history of work that tends to look at consumers as basically being conned, being conned by advertisers, being conned into buying, buying things and so on. That really got sort of pushed to one side by another set of work, especially in the 1980s, um, of which a lot of it was very celebratory of the consumer as somehow making up their own identities and through what they bought um, and so on. And also another set of sociological work which was tending to look at particular kinds of types of uh, shoppers and con consumers um, and reading them in relation to particular kinds of um, identities, especially uh, class and so on. Um, one particular piece of work that I think is, is quite interesting, because, partly because it entailed um, lots of hanging out with people shopping, and then there's been other uh, work like this, um, is Danny Miller's work on theory, the theory of shopping. And his is really a sort of semi-polemical, um, argument against uh, the making it all up and celebrating your individual identity. So um, he argues that an awful lot of shopping is very mundane, it's quite boring and so on. Um, and for his field work, he mainly um, went um, off supermarket shopping, especially uh, with young mothers. And I can see why he came up with that sort of <laughs> account. Um, so he makes a lot of accounts about thrift and self-sacrifice and so on. But I think what's pretty clear is that just talking about shopping as this monolithic single thing is too simple. And what we need is more nuanced and varied accounts. And we need to know what goes on in different kinds of shopping. And I think it does make sense to think about museum gift shop shopping as a particular category, not least that in this financial crisis as everywhere else was uh, sinking in sales, 
museum gift shops pretty much kept or increased uh, their sales, which I think is, is, is very interesting. So other things that might be going on, as well as things linked with questions of identity and so on, key questions, how does that, that museum shopping link with visiting? Um, questions about education, is it a continuation of educating yourself in whatever perhaps you have um, been visiting for? And I, I think the British Museum would be interested, especially in knowing about some of that. And where does it fit within that whole idea of the experience? And there's a lot of talk about museum visiting as part of the experience economy and so on. Where, as part of it, the museum experience is, is shopping. And it sounds from what you guys said that it certainly is part of it. <laughs> okay, let me just um, say something about the history of uh, museums and shops. So, they, they certainly, ha museums and shops have this very interestingly entangled history. So, especially in the 19th century, which is often seen as this time of the birth of the modern public museum, really actually very closely alongside the birth of the department store. And actually a lot of shared aesthetics, a lot of shared actual um, uh, people designing the cases and so on uh, in both. So historically the Bon Marché usually um, gets the billing as being the world's first department store, but people in Newcastle find that very annoying because they say Bainbridges was earlier in 38. Um, but I put there a couple of pictures um, of the Bon Marché, and I think you can see very clearly in the one below just the um, just how much it looks like a museum gallery, and in fact it was modelled uh, on the Louvre. Uh, for, for some of its some of its space, so especially within Europe and um, also the U.S., we have the, the department store really expanding uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. And I just mentioned there uh, Zola's Le Bonheur des Dames or the Lady's Paradise, which I actually think has just been made into a television program, which I haven't, I haven't seen actually, but the novel is brilliant, it's the most fabulous account actually, a wonderful kind of lively social history with wonderful detail about um, the way these department stores worked. Um, so here really I'm just putting some pictures just to really show that shared aesthetic in many, many ways. So we have that glass case, so that top left uh, displays could so easily be a museum um, display and the whole layout of that particular department store uh, there, down there on the right. Um, there's also a lot of shared concern um, about how people would behave and also about laying things out so that people would behave in, in the right way. Um, and. Uh, Also, sort of discourse about the nature of the object and its attractiveness and what it might do, um, and this, in some ways, was 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 stronger in stores because it was easier for people to get their uh, get their hands on things. And one of the things that happened in in this period of the growth of the department store was actually a growth of particular kinds <coughs> of social pathologies and individual pathologies, and one of those was the disease of kleptomania, which was really um, kind of popularized and named in, in this period. And this was um, an affliction, especially of um, middle class women who would go into these beautiful department stores, and there would be so many things that they wanted to get their hands on that they didn't always pay for them, they acquired them. And I chose this picture actually because it's got some gloves <laughs> at the front. And one of the most attractive, the things that was most often taken were gloves. Um, I guess, you know, you could decide to try some on and <laughs> sort of, you know, disappear off. Um, 
but there were accounts of women who would go and they would um, they would end up they wouldn't just take one pair but over time they would try to get the full color range <laughs> and there was this idea of this fetishistic uh, collection collecting which was also a seen as a growing pathology so these pathologies of this world that was opening up of this of, of ac mass access to things, of all these very attractive, very vibrant things, especially gloves. I really understand the gloves. Um, <laughs> the gloves. Nice gloves. Um, so, one of the things, it seems to me, that is very interesting is this question of the power of the object and this, this attraction and it's more potential moral danger that you might want to have more of them. You might want to have lots of them. Um, and what starts is a kind of discourse of concern about these things. It's quite gendered, especially women were seen as the weak-willed ones who are very likely to succumb to the power of the object. And there's often linked to ideas of them wandering free in these, these places. Um, but it, it was also about class. If a working class woman was uh, found taking things, it was normally seen as, well, she was doing it out of necessity. She was there for a criminal history logic, and um, she would be convicted. Middle class women weren't always, because it was seen as this sort of medicalized issue of why would such respectable women do this? It must have been the power of the things themselves. Um, quick whiz through some other little bits, clip, clips of history. I just w one other interesting narrative I think is about the way that um, the shop and the museum become entangled um, through the idea of display and artworks. And there's a, a whole lot of artworks, and here's one by An Andy Warhol with I think a very very interesting uh, quote where he says all department stores will become museums and all museums will become department stores. We can think about whether that's happened. Um, but in terms of museum shops themselves, um, I, somebody's supposed to be about to publish something uh, on the history, but from what I and I, I've really just done a sort of a dive in, really. Um, but certainly one of the places that has a claim on being one of the earliest and most major, because I suppose the question, when do you call it a shop? If it's just two postcards on the counter, is it a shop? Um, but one of them is the shop at the Met, which opened in 1908. Um, and this was pretty snazzy pretty quickly um, and actually very ahead of its time in lots of ways and it actually had a mail order catalogue um, by 1921. Um, <coughs> the fact that the Met did this seems kind of not surprising given that it always had quite a sort of commercial outlook as well so it was um, uh, in being established it's uh, Founders were J.P. Morgan, the bankers, and uh, George Hearn and Benjamin Altman were uh, department store owners. So that was part of its um, background. But very early, it also began, it set up design studios for producing things for sale, modeled on the things uh, in the shop. Um, and, and from 1917, it actually created exhibitions each year of these things. I want to just read you a little bit about what went on those. So what happened is they created these exhibitions in which each commodity was exhibited next to the artifact um, from which its design was derived. So you had reproductions of colonial furniture next to 18th century um, so-called originals, um, affordable jewelry against Byzantine ivories, embroidered crests against American sports skirts. Um, and it says, visitors were astonished as they passed commercial containers looking like Athenian vases, or by wallpapers with the look of ecclesiastical vest vestments. In the 1920 show, and this is what my picture is of, 
it's not very good because I couldn't find a good one. Um, but there was something called charming talc, talcum powder, <laughs> next to Ming vases, dating from the period 1644 to 1662. And oh, and I especially should mention uh, the Colgate toothpaste containers, which were uh, especially put next to particular art objects. So this was going on um, uh, then at that time. But the Met wasn't the only place doing this. And across the park in New York, um, at the American M Museum of Na Natural History, there was um, uh, a guy called uh, Morris de Camp Crawford, um, who partly worked in the museum on Peruvian textiles, but he also had a second job, which was as research editor for Women's Wear Daily. Um, and one of the things that he was really also developing was using the museum um, uh, as a place for design and creating fashion for American <coughs> women that would, and I wanted to create this as well, um, it would enable American women, quote, uh, to not have to express in their clothing the decadence which is so widespread in the countries of Europe. <laughs> um, but even over in uh, decadent Europe, um, places like the v &A, they were also doing, uh, uh, doing some, some of this. But despite that background, it really, the, the sort of move towards places regularly having shops really comes in the 80s and 90s and uh, so somebody who sort of writes a book of advice for museums sort of says you know that's when it really starts happening and you you get a really big um expansion at that time a whole set of reasons behind that so in the uk that being partly connected with funding and so on um, but also part of a move to walk more widely um, on the one hand of recognizing shopping as a kind of leisure activity that people like doing and that idea spreading and realizing that the museum could be part of that. Um, a more relaxed idea about sort of high culture and popular culture spreading. Obviously they'd relaxed it already back in, in, in the Met. Um, and, but at the same time, and for me, though I guess there might be other people who remember this, so when I kind of started working on museums really kind of at the end of the, the 80s, um, it was a time when people were really bothered about all these things, about the potential commercialization of museums through having shops and um, is often talked about in terms of Disneyfication and um, at these commerce and culture uh, uh, debates um, going on and you can see in things like um, this advert that I put up from that uh, that time this is an advert for the V&A but you have to look very closely um, you have to look really closely maybe far away here, to see that it, this is an advert for the V&A because its name is right at the bottom very small so you have this advert of um, some piece of art somewhere hiding behind something and saying there's nothing wrong with modern art that a good cup of tea won't cure. The V&A, an ace calf with quite a nice museum attached. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how, and there are a whole set of adverts like this, advertising the museum as an adjunct to its cafe. Um, but what in many ways I, I think is interesting is the whole way those debates were held, the fact that this was seen as an issue, that there was this sort of conflict between, um, between commerce and culture. Um, but that was going on with this massive expansion of the shop um, and this move towards, um, within uh, museums, uh, the exit through the gift shop. Uh, relaying museums so that that would happen, which very, very many um, do now. So, in effect, as Alison Griffiths has nicely put it, turning the shop into your sort of final gallery that you visit is the, usually the last thing. Not everyone manages it, but it's um, that really started coming along. Um, other just cases from that period that were seen as very significant um, when that big bit under the Louvre after the, the um, Empire's Pyramid was built. 
uh, that, that big sh shopping area there. That was very, very hotly debated at that time with all, with all its shops and, and, and so on. And uh, arguments like Louise McTavish's piece that she wrote in Cultural Studies where she's saying on the one hand this seems to be trying to sort of blur and mix high culture and popular culture but what she argued was this is constantly reinstated because the Louvre doesn't know that it really wants to allow this. So this, this sort of discourse constantly about shopping as potentially <laughs> reshaping um, the nature of the museum itself. Um, anyway, by now, they're everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, it's surprising if you end up in a um, a museum that doesn't have a shop and they vary from those where you know you're definitely going into a shop to those where they just sort of blur straight off the rest of the displays and you suddenly find, wait, where am I? I'm in a shop, have I? Uh, in, in the museum. Um, and such a range of kinds of things. I just put some images of things there so some of them really showing off that they have very reasonably priced things accessible to everybody um, and you can also go and buy very expensive things. So in my own sort of hanging about, sorts of things that I think are of interest, the questions about that whole what goes into choosing what will be in the shop, um, including there questions of economics, so that decision to have those things of one pound and so on, as well as to have things of, actually I've forgotten what's the most expensive thing in the British Museum, is it £10,000 or even more? I've forgotten. I've never resolved anyway. prices yet. <laughs> uh, I've got one figure that I think is 10000 but I think there might be something even more expensive. Um, but what goes into that, what's involved in that, and how does it relate to the display styles and the content um, of the museum? And you have this whole range of sorts of display styles from those where you have objects very beautifully within cases to um, dumper bins of these kind of things where you can rummage and get your hands in. They're apparently very popular. I think that has to be something about the, the haptic moment that you finally get to hold on to things after all that deprivation of being <laughs> in the museum. Um, and uh, yeah, and how that works in terms of the particular kinds of relationships to the things in the museum. And I've, I've written about that previously in terms of ideas of particular kinds of indexing. So the things that are the reproductions of the things in the museum, the things that just kind of have the insignia of the museum somehow. They tell you that it's been there. And then a whole set of very, very loose associations. And when I was kind of setting up this project, I went talking to lots of people running museums. Um, <coughs> several told me that if you have any taxidermy in your museum, it's great because then you can have cuddly animals and animals of any sort and they, they sell well um, because kids uh, like to pester for them especially. Um, so some museums, uh, so again just some pictures of, of various ones in the British Museum where this particular research um, uh, for, for the uh, collaborative doctoral award would be based. Um, there's a range of museums ranging from those with the very, um, uh, 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 I don't use the word cheap, the very um, good value, <laughs> very good value things, uh, 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 right through to um, the, these reproductions and I can't quite see the price on there, but I, um, I think Pegasus there. I think he is ten thousand pounds, but I, I've forgotten. And people do apparently come in and buy those sometimes. Yeah. Um, so just some other <laughs> images here of the way that actually has become very, very specialised, often in recent years, to very particular kinds of shops with specific aesthetics. Re sometimes really, really um, picking up from the particular. Um, uh, particular aspects of the museum's history or styles and so on. Um, there is here then the, also the question of the museum staff and what they're, um, what, what they're doing. Do they see themselves 
and do they operate essentially as curators or not? Where are the differences? What are the um, boundaries? How do they talk about objects? Is it in similar ways? And what is the relationship with the rest of the museum? And I, I did end up collecting quite a lot of stories um, of different kinds about that when I was just sort of doing some background, which I'll talk about if you like, but I'm going to go quite quickly. But also their, their particular techniques for knowing about their visitors. And one thing I was really struck by was actually the really high levels of knowledge and of observation. And some of the people I talked to were clearly brilliant observers. They were kind of ethnographers themselves um, of people going into shops. So um, one uh, shop manager told me, for example, I know straight away when people go in, are they going to buy or not? She also told me how she, um, she can do a seven-year-old boy, for example. <laughs> And she acted this out for me, and it was very convincing about the sorts of decisions about what to buy and how. So, fabulous source of kind of interesting knowledge and so on. Um, key questions, of course, are about um, what do people do? What do they buy? How long do they spend in the shop? Does it have a relationship with what they've seen or not? Does that uh, matter? Are there particular kinds of shoppers? Can we relate that to particular existing socio-demographic uh, um, uh, categories? Or maybe we need other sorts of uh, ways of thinking about that. And then finally, just, just finally for this moment, um, what happens later? What do people do with that? If we go back to that idea about the, the things in the museum and the things outside, what is the relationship of that? So if we follow through that object biography, where might we end up? Or we might end up with thinking about what do people um, do with things later? And this, embarrassingly enough probably, um, is what well, was my son's, um, in my son's bedroom before I just moved house. And I just was wandering around the house thinking about actually what have we got from museum shops? And I went into his room and I realised actually there were quite a lot of uh, things there. So all the things with a, a star on them, they definitely are. Some of the others sort of a bit marginal, but um, it, maybe we'll have to follow some of you up. And you can go and do this, this yourselves uh, later. So really, you know, this is kind of a manifesto for why I think there's an awful lot of uh, that is very, very interesting to potentially uh, investigate um, in museums. Uh, shops and shopping and I'd be really interested to hear your views about things that you think are of interest and what you might have brought along <laughs> from museum shops. So thank you very much.